Once upon a time, there was a girl who dared to resist injustice and refused to be anybody but herself. Her name was Frida. When Frida was a child, music floated through the halls of her home in Amsterdam. Frida's father was a classical pianist, and all three of her siblings played instruments, too. When Frida was about 10 years old, she learned to play the cello, a big string instrument with a warm, mellow sound. When Frida's fingers moved over its strings, she felt the vibrations sparkle through her body. There was something magical about music. With each soaring note, each quiet pause, and each diving run, Frida saw thousands of stories come to life. Sometimes, when she closed her eyes, she imagined herself on stage as a part of an orchestra, moving her bow to the beat of the conductor's baton. And then, she saw a different image. Herself as the conductor. Each movement of her hand drawing out another melody and changing the story. It was the 1910s, though, and Frida had never seen a woman conductor before. But Frida wouldn't let a thing like that ever hold her back. I'm Leah Delaria, and this is Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls a fairy tale podcast about the rebel women who inspire us. On this episode, Frida Belenfante, pioneering musical conductor, freedom fighter, proud lesbian, and lifelong teacher. When Frida was 17, she made her professional debut. Oh, the lovely sounds of Frida's cello echoed off the concert hall's cream-colored walls and filled up the spectators' hearts. Frida continued to perform, and she also taught lessons to children. She loved teaching them to put their hearts and souls into each note they played. A choir from Amsterdam University asked Frida to conduct them as well. Together, they gave a big concert with 110 singers and musicians on stage. The musicians begged her to do more, so they continued performing. Following one of their shows, a woman approached her. If you can do that with an amateur orchestra, imagine what you can do with professionals, she gushed. Frida's heart warmed to the praise, but she frowned. Well, I wouldn't get professionals to play for me, she said. Why not try it? The woman asked. So... Frida recruited professional musicians and formed her own orchestra. They rehearsed for months. She memorized their music and knew every note from every instrument by heart. Frida loved the music that poured out of them. She loved how it felt to conduct them. She loved the way they responded to each small gesture she made. A while later, Frida's best friend pulled her aside. You can't just get up there and say I'm a conductor, her friend said. You haven't even been trained as a conductor. Frida jutted out her chin defiantly and said, If I think I can do it, I will do it. 
In November 1937, Frida's orchestra gave their first concert. At the beginning of the performance, Frida stepped up onto the conductor's podium. She gave a slight bow to the audience, and then she turned to her musicians. She raised her baton, and with a wave of her arms, the music began. Her musicians moved their fingers and bows with brilliant precision. When they finished, the hall was filled with applause. Reviews of the concert were glowing. Frida Belenfante has a talent for conducting, one critic wrote. And with that, Frida became one of the first female orchestra conductors in Europe. And Frida's friend never tried to stand in the way of her dreams again. Frida continued conducting, but a cloud soon loomed over Frida's success. Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany in 1933, and in the years that followed, Frida sensed a storm coming closer and closer every year. Then, in May 1940, Nazi troops invaded Frida's country. Violence spread across the Netherlands, and fear grew in Frida's heart. In the 1930s and 40s, Nazis made laws that targeted and harmed Jewish people. They arrested and killed millions of Jews and other innocent individuals just because of their religion, ethnicity, and who they were. Frida was half Jewish and had many Jewish friends and family members. And there was something else that put Frida at risk. Her greatest loves and romantic partners were women. And Nazis sent people like her and the lesbian and gay friends she often hung out with to prison camps too. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. And Frida wouldn't stand for it. Frida joined forces with other artists and freedom fighters in Amsterdam to create what became known as the Dutch Resistance. To do her part, Frida became an expert at forging documents. The Nazis required all Jewish people to carry an ID stamped with the letter J. So Frida and her friends made new papers without the J, so that the Jews who came to them could find safety. The smell of ink and glue surrounded Frida as she worked. With a small blade in hand, she carefully cut bits off of one document and pasted them onto another. One day, when a Jewish couple missed their appointment to pick up their papers, Frida went to their home. Members of the Nazi police, the Gestapo, were there. They arrested Frida and threw her into the back of the car. They took her back to headquarters, but as they questioned her, Frida played dumb. The officers got so frustrated that they finally let her go. Frida ran home as fast as she could. But Frida and her friends knew there was one major flaw in their forgery operation. There were duplicates of the real documents in Amsterdam's civil registry office. So they made a dangerous plan. They would destroy the duplicates too. In March 1943, 
resistance members who were dressed as policemen entered the civil registry office and said they were searching for explosives. They cleared out any staff and security guards and then, when no one was watching, set off their own explosives. The fire raged, burning through stacks and piles of papers. By the time the firefighters put out the flames, hundreds of thousands of documents were destroyed. But it came at a cost. Twelve of Frida's collaborators were arrested and killed. Frida's heart ached at the loss of her friends. She was afraid she might be next. So she came up with a new plan. She would dress like a man, and she would go into hiding. Frida made herself new identity documents, put on a suit, and went to a barber. Shave? the barber asked. Her heart beat loud in her chest, and she took a deep breath. (sighs) Just a cut, she told him in a low voice. She watched as locks of her dark hair floated to the ground. For three months, Frida stayed with one friend and then another, but she knew she was endangering them all. So Frida decided to escape. Frida joined forces with Tony, another refugee, to find their way to safety. More than once, they were chased by the Gestapo and had to run for it. Finally, they made their way to the border between France and Switzerland. By then, France was in Nazi control, but Switzerland was a neutral country. Frida and Tony swam across an icy river. Then they walked in the mountains for 12 hours without stopping, their feet crunching on the snow. When they finally entered Switzerland, they were arrested by Swiss authorities, separated, and forced to prove they were refugees. Frida was placed in a camp with 160 other Dutch refugees. After all she had lost, she felt dead inside. She didn't know how she could go on. She didn't understand how such horrible things could happen. But several months later, in 1945, the Nazis surrendered and the war in Europe was over. When Frida returned to Amsterdam, nothing was the same. Nobody talked about the war. People who had cooperated with the Nazis still held powerful positions, including as leaders of orchestras. In Frida's heart, the music was gone. She didn't know if she'd ever get it back. So, in 1947, Frida decided to make a change. She packed her bags, and her cello, and moved to the United States. Eventually, she landed in California, where she shared a house with her new partner. Frida began playing cello again. She performed concerts and played for Hollywood studios. One day, one of her fellow performers asked if she was that famous female conductor from the Netherlands. Frida said yes. Would you like to conduct? He asked. Of course, she said. (laughs) Then she laughed. But you can't just say, I am a conductor. Where is my orchestra? The man told her that there were many musicians in Hollywood who were tired of playing movie scores. They wanted to play symphonies, not sound effects. So... In the early 1950s, he helped Frida create a new music group. And at almost 50 years old, 
for the second time, Frida was conducting her own professional orchestra. After months of rehearsals, they performed their first concert. When they played their last note, the audience gave them a standing ovation, which turned into 12 curtain calls. They just would not stop clapping. Frida conducted the Orange County Philharmonic until 1962. Then the people in charge suggested a man might be better suited to be a conductor. They also seemed to think it was a problem that Frida had romantic relationships with women. Frida was heartbroken to once again lose an orchestra she had helped create. But she never gave up on music or on being herself. For years, she taught conducting and cello at UCLA. She built up community music programs, and she never stopped working with young people. Frida Belinfante broke down gender barriers to become one of the first female orchestra conductors in Europe. She fought against the injustices of the Nazis, putting her life on the line each day. And she lived her life boldly and without shame, proud to be exactly who she was. But more than anything, she devoted her life to helping people, from her music students, to her friends, to her Jewish neighbors. Once, Frida said, I don't understand people that can only live for themselves. Where do you get your happiness? Where do you get your satisfaction? What do you do with your life? There must be somebody who needs help. There always is. This podcast is a production of Rebel Girls and is based on the book series Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls. This episode was produced by Isaac Kaplan Woolner. Sound design and mixing by me, Camille Stennis. This episode was written by Alexa Stratton and proofread by Simi Katagamar. Executive producer is Katie Springer. A big thanks to the whole Rebel Girls team who make this show possible. Original theme music was composed and performed by Eletra Barjaki. For more, visit rebelgirls.com. Until next time, stay rebel. Rebel.